I looked down at my leg that had two deep gashes on the side going away from me. I had it a lot better than the other men. My arms were scraped as well, but nonetheless, fine. Shifting my eyes around in the darkness, I looked for any sign of life. <sighs> this is all I could get out. Looking around, I noticed the sheer massacre the ship went through. Pieces of aluminum everywhere. Glass, sprockets, nuts, bolts, everything. As I started into the scrap heap that was my ship, I noticed a hand lying flat on the sand, reaching out for someone, something to help. I wasn't sure whose hand it was. Oh, fuck. I pushed against the rock my leg was resting on to thrust myself towards the outstretched, yet limp hand. Inch by inch, I got closer to the beacon of flesh on the mountain of metal. Shifting rocks and metal out of the way, I got closer to the wreckage and tugged on the hand. I pulled and pulled harder and harder. And finally, something gave way. I yanked the arm out of the wreckage and nothing more. The stump of it still bleeding. I squirmed away and dropped it without a second thought. I rubbed up my hands on my pants to try to get the blood off, and in the struggle my helmet shifted in an uncon well, uncomfortable position, so I shifted it back and laid down, pain searing in my legs, and darkness descended. I woke to a renewed hold on my situation. I sat up and maybe too soon for a for I felt a searing pain in my arms and legs. Oh, God. Something needed to happen here. The gashes were already crusty and red around the edges. I cursed at them and sauntered off to the cabin, which was now a mess. Things strewn every which way. And after a short while of searching, however, I found a med pack and began working on my legs and arms. Shortly after getting down... I fell asleep where I was. Haze was all I could see when I woke up, and it was here to stay. It had begun raining while I was under, and was still pouring when I woke up. I began moving, trying to stretch, trying to feel some kind of good feeling. And eventually I could stand, but only for a few minutes before falling down again. Shards of pain started filling up my body, like an untapped reservoir, waiting to overflow. While I, while I was munching on a protein bar from my bag I retrieved earlier, another hand shot out from under the rocket wreckage. I jumped up and hurried over, dropping my bar in the process. Hey, hey, it's okay. I almost collapsed on the hand. I smiled broadly down at it as I hurried to grab it to bring the man up to the surface. I began digging with my hands, burying my fingernails into the sand. Julio was unearthed like a modern mummy, wrapped a space uniform that had been, well, seen much better days. Was his name Julio, though? Yeah, we met before we launched, a brilliant engineering tech on board our rocket this time around. His face was covered in the sand that was wiped away with some cloth I tore off the shoulder part of my suit. Here you go, brother. You're gonna be okay. I hold his right arm over my shoulder and hauled him over to a rock to prop him up. Once there, I frantically looked around for some more food and some water which I had yet to find. And sure enough, I found some white canisters I knew to hold water and took them over to Julio. I doused him a few times and then spread thin droplets of it over his lips so he could drink, but only a little for now. Next, I checked to see if he was injured. Not anywhere I could see, but he was very tired and had coughing fits throughout the night. We slept for an uncomfortably long amount of time. The next morning I woke him with a good slap on the cheek. Startled, he jumped away from me and tried to speak. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. He looked at me and then at the wreckage. Yeah, I know, we bit the dust pretty hard. I already looked, and there's still plenty of food that didn't burn up on impact, and there's some gear we could probably use too. Spluttering, he managed to- Where? Well, where are we? No idea, my friend. There wasn't a planet in the way of our trajectory, so I don't know. 
All I know is that the system started failing once we reached the October Cloud. Stanson, is anyone else... Is anyone else still alive? No, I looked and nothing. Julio met my stare with utter fear and hesitance. Why did we even go through the October Cloud anyway? We knew that was restricted territory. All I can say is that I guess our captain didn't hear that speech. It doesn't matter now. I say we pack up what we've got and scope out the land. We need to see if there are any other inhabitants that can help us. Maybe send off a communication back to I-832, well, our home. We've got enough food for two weeks. We'll see how far that gets us. Julio mustered up his energy and leapt off the rock and started to help me pack. After about ten minutes, we set off, looking one last time at the wreckage of what was probably our last flight. Two days later, we reached an outcropping of rock, shaped like a dinner plate. We decided on flat top we would set up camp and a fire for the night, call it quits for another, any other travel. While I was making dinner, I asked Julio to get us some firewood, weeds, whatever he could find to make a fire. He trotted down from the dinner plate rock and stopped in front of a small stand of trees. Near them he saw a small pile of branches. He stooped down to grab them and said, Ah, here we go. Let's make a fire to scare away the jackals. A thick club was thrust down onto his head from behind a nearby tree. (coughs) Julio was down, not knowing what hit him, and the creature stepped out from the foliage, teeth shimmering in the sunlit night. He took off Julio's clothes one by one and placed them over himself. Julio, it's about time. Where have you been? You go hiking up Everest without me? Julio climbed back onto the dinner plate rock and sat down with the branches. Just getting wood for the fire. Just don't go too far. We don't know what, if anything, is out there. Got it? Julio smiled serenely up at me and said, You got it. After we ate and enjoyed the fire, we slept a very disturbed sleep that night. The next morning, I woke to find Julio already packed and ready to set off. Whoa, eager to get going, huh? Yeah. Look over there. The winds from the day before had cleared up to reveal a delta a few miles away. Hey, good high. Let's see what's over there. We made it to the delta. I was jotting a few things down about our travels in my journal when a small asteroid entered the atmosphere and made a popping sound far from where we were. Hey, um, why are we still here? To take a break, aren't aren't you tired, Julio? Let's go. I watched him as he kicked at the dirt and cast a stern look over in my direction every few seconds. We've been here for 20 minutes. I looked at him and sneered. (laughs) He then walked off behind a tree. He pounded his fists into a nearby tree and thought hard about the situation. It wasn't very often a man came to this planet... He had just been in the right place at the right time. And now that he was with the man, he didn't know how to be patient enough to get him to the true destination. Julio ambled out of the woods and faced me. I said, You're right, we should probably get going, I suppose. I said this mostly to avoid any further conflict. We were already in dire straits as it was. I think we should go this way. Maybe we can find some water through here. Yeah, sounds good, I said. We left the delta and trodden on through the trees that grew more and more dense as the miles went by. Julio kept glancing back every once in a while, then he seemed to be wearing an accusatory face. I wasn't quite sure why. And after some time trudging through the dense bushes and leaves... We spotted a large wooden sign hanging suspended between two trees. I didn't recognize the language, but something about how dense the writing was gave me the impression it was a warning. Hey Julio, let's hold up for a second. He stopped, but didn't face me. I don't think we should go this way. Maybe we can try approaching from a different direction. This one just seems to be a warning or something. No. I think we should proceed. Julio got more impatient and stamped its feet. 
Don't you see the sign? We shouldn't go this way. We'll just try something else. I was getting a little frustrated with Julio. Why was he so confrontational all of a sudden? I began walking through a clump of bushes just in front of the sign to try to see what was beyond the sign at a different angle, somewhere down the trail. Julio, whatever's beyond the sign could be dangerous. We need to approach with caution. With that, I felt my skull crack with the sound of something hard and cold to the touch. Then, darkness. Julio, seething, held Stanson by the feet and dragged him through where the sign was hanging, now coated with droplets of blood. Before me stood a group of creatures. All had scalish skin, small black eyes, and were very thin. They were not a recognizable species to me. They were talking quietly before a fire in the moonlit night and transformed when I struggled against the ropes they had around me. They were morphing. Their skin, their eyes, everything changed in a matter of seconds. And all of them looked at me. They looked like me. Human! What are you doing here? Crash landed. I sputtered, coughing up a little blood and still feeling the beating Julio gave me. By the way, where'd that bastard go, Julio? Have you now? Where? Well, how am I supposed to know? Somewhere in the desert. Probably 30 miles from where I got smacked in the head by one of you. We glanced around at each other and offered no sympathy to me in my condition. One of them shifted, and I noticed one of the creatures a distance away from the others watching. He was still wearing Julio's clothing, but his face was transformed into a malicious mixture of contempt and warped familiarity, as he also looked like me. So, human, take us! They walked over and untied me. Once I was free, I used what was left of my strength and pushed over one of the creatures closest to me. With the rest of their group trying to help the two back to their feet, I ran off into the bushes. Light green leaves pricked at my suit, tearing strips of material off and left me a ragged newspaper of a man. Once I got to a small shed, half hidden between a tree and a rock face to the left. I looked around quickly, knowing my kidnappers were close behind and I could hear their panting from a ways off, the ragged, enraged breathing. I slammed the door to the shed and looked around. Too dark. In my suit, I still had a pocket light. Turning it on, I noticed some bundles on the floor of the shed. Inside was some food and a weapon. The creatures must have had someone posted here, looking for stragglers from other planets. I took one and slowly slid back the door of the shed. Nothing. I stood in the doorway for a while just listening. Crickets sounded. Birds sang. Various songs chirped. And I scratched the stubble on my face waiting. I took the gun out of the cloth and was ready to shoot if they dared come this way. Men! Check the shed! One called chiefly. I ran as fast as I could out the shed door and back into the bushes, trees, and through tangles in which birds were still singing their songs. Rushing over a downed tree, I stumbled and fell headfirst into a thicket. Oh, God. Blood started to seep into my suit. I could feel it. Hey! It's another one! A booming voice said. I struggled to turn around quick enough, but when I did, I saw a man in his spacesuit turned toward me and reaching out with his hand. Here, take my hand and I'll get you out of there. Hurts like hell, doesn't it? I didn't know what to say, but took his hand. What's your name, son? Stanson. Yours? Roland. Follow me over here. He led me over a mountain of bushes to a large camp filled with space-suited men. I found one. Hey, um, how'd you get here, son? (sighs) Crash landed. He crash-landed. His name is Stanson. So, boys, pay him respect, get him some food, water, and make him a nice bed. 
Stunson, follow me. We went down the mound and into the camp. While I ate, I noticed one of the rocket men left his wallet next to my bag. Oddly, his identification classified him as being in the fourth fleet. But how could that be? That fleet was lost at least 100 years earlier. The man would have to be... The spaceman understood what I discovered as I looked up, eyes wide with, with fear at them all. The forest ringed with white spacesuits started to close in. Their skin rapidly started transforming and morphing. A greenish hue began to engulf the creatures, forming long snouts. Roland rounded on me and knocked me out from under my feet. Gasping and reaching to get away from the creatures, I instead held onto my badge. It read 599LST Fleet. LST stood for Longitudinal Solar Technician. Might as well have been called the last fleet. And why 599? Was that the last number before 600? The last point of no return before the animals tear your eyes out? Inga rose up inside me and I lashed out at the transforming rocket men before me. Tears rushed out from the corner of my eye. As I rushed toward another, my eyes wild and rearing as a wild boar against his poacher. The unknown language I heard once before signaled a temporary silence a frozen troop of assailants. A group of around seven or so emerged out of the woods. One in front nodded, and they ran into the crowd of others. Some communication was had, and the one in front with the badge name Roland pointed at me. At that moment, the rocket men hurled them themselves at me with all they could muster, and then I fell. Beatings from the right and left I became numb quickly and was free. I felt my body call through the firmly rooted forest floor and raise up. I speak to you now as a friend, a rocket man, and a warning. Think of me when you pass the October cloud. I am the last rocket man. <laughs>